Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. It's been 50 years since Neil Armstrong famously stepped off the footpad of an Apollo lunar lander and onto a new celestial body for the first time in human history. And once he was safely standing on the surface of the moon, he spoke perhaps some of the most famous words of all time. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But something about this always confused me. I mean, sure, the step off of the Lunar Lander's 91 centimeter foot pad was a nice, easy, and small step. But the step just before that was actually enormous. I'm talking about this, the huge gap between the last rung of the ladder and the ground. I mean, why on the moon is that gap so huge? Isn't it dangerous to require an astronaut to jump down onto the surface and then have to jump back up? The lunar lander's ladder had nine rungs, all spaced out at 22.8 centimeters apart from each other. But the gap between the last rung and the ground was about three times that, at a whopping 76 centimeters. So really, the ladder wasn't missing one rung, it was missing two. I mean, sure, the gravity is only one sixth that of Earth's, but wouldn't it have been so much safer if there was even just one more rung that closed that gap up just a little? So today we're gonna look into why NASA and the Lunar Lander's manufacturer Grumman chose a ladder of this length. We'll then talk about all the design considerations of the hardware, the unknown conditions of the lunar surface itself, and the astronauts who were basically just too smooth the pilots to get the ladder's last rung any closer to the surface of the moon. Let's get started. Three, two, one, and stop. That's one small step for man. That's two contact with the first one. On May 25th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy announced his goal of putting humans on the moon by the end of the decade to Congress. At the time of this historic and ambitious announcement, the US had exactly 15 minutes and 22 seconds of human spaceflight experience with just one suborbital launch under their belt. By the way, I should probably mention that Kennedy's speech in front of Congress is not the famous we choose to go to the moon speech. That happened over a year later at Rice Stadium in Houston. But the point is, this insanely ambitious goal almost immediately put a lot of things in motion. A tsunami of engineering ensued. I mean, so much so, sometimes it feels like the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. One item that almost immediately began development was the lunar lander itself. In July 1962, 11 companies were asked to submit proposals for a lunar lander. Grumman won the contract and began to design mock-ups as early as 1963. Wait, what's all this have to do with a ladder? Well, hold up, I'm setting up a story here, and to me these stories are half the fun, these little fun nuggets of history. But this particular bit of history is one of the key reasons why the ladder is the wrong length. Grumman was building a lander intended to land on a surface that we knew literally nothing about. This is understandable when the only data we had at the time was from the orbiters taking footage from the Ranger missions, and before that we just had ground-based telescopes here on Earth. Well, I guess actually Ranger 6 through 9 actually recorded footage all the way up until impact, resulting in some footage with an impressive resolution of 0.3 meters. But we still had almost no idea of what the surface of the moon was actually like. It wouldn't be until June 2nd, 1966 before the US would soft land Surveyor 1 on the moon, some four months after the Soviet Union landed Luna 9. This would be the first time there'd be any data available to the US about the composition of the moon's surface. And even so, it was quite limited. This means during the first three years of development of the lunar lander, there were countless question marks. Many scientists thought the surface might be so soft and powdery, it might swallow a spacecraft or people entirely on the surface, sinking them so deep they wouldn't be able to get out. While NASA was busy sending spacecraft after spacecraft to observe the moon, Grumman was deep in development of the lunar lander. The first couple years saw a lot of changes, including things like going from five legs to four legs, from a round cockpit to more of a polyhedral shape, and even going from a round hatch to a square hatch. Oh, by the way, that round hatch led to astronauts really struggling to get back into the spacecraft, so Grumman switched to a square version to help make egress and ingress that much easier. This is also around the same time that Grumman was playing around with using a rope instead of a ladder, which astronauts found to actually be impossible, and despite them using a Peter Pan pulley system which would simulate 1-6 gravity. So Grumman opted for a ladder down the front leg of the lunar lander. But even with something as simple as a ladder, weight was an enormous factor. I mean, after all, for each kilogram landed on the surface of the moon, 
It takes about 400 kilograms of rocket to launch from Earth. This means Grumman went to great lengths to cut weight, including ditching seats and using lightweight golden cap ton foil for insulation. But it also means the latter, like all things, needed to be extremely lightweight. For example, I think my favorite thing to think about is how if the lunar lander were standing on its own legs here on Earth, it would have likely collapsed under its own weight because those legs weren't meant for Earth's gravity. They were only designed to handle the moon's weaker gravity. And the same thing goes for the ladder. If you were to try to ascend the ladder, the actual ladder here on Earth, it would have likely broken because it's not meant to handle Earth's gravity. So they made it as lightweight as possible and only capable of handling one sixth gravity. But weight likely isn't the main reason why the ladder stops short of the surface. For this, we need to look at the landing gear the ladder is affixed to. The landing gear were designed to absorb the energy of impact and keep the LEM from toppling over. Grumman engineers were incredibly concerned with the LEM tipping over, so a significant amount of work went into the design of the landing gear. The landing gear was so vital that after the command module and the lunar excursion module undocked, the command module pilot was instructed to visually inspect all four legs to make sure they were properly deployed from their stowed position. A leg that wasn't properly locked in place would have been an immediate abort. But fortunately, none of them failed to deploy. One interesting design consideration was the invention of a single-use shock absorber. NASA and Grumman developed a crushable honeycomb aluminum cartridge, otherwise known as a crush core. There was a great concern about using hydraulics in the landing gear in fear that they could leak and leave a landing leg unusable. So, for simplicity's sake, they went with the crush core, which is basically just a set of cartridges made of aluminum that either compress or stretch to provide smooth and reliable resistance. This technology is still used today for certain applications. Actually, SpaceX has crush core in the landing struts of their Falcon 9 rockets. If the hydraulic shock absorbers bottom out, they have additional travel in the single-use crush core. This was very obvious on TICOM 8, which launched and landed on May 27, 2016. The booster had a little bit of a rough landing, resulting in one of the landing legs eating into the crush core, which made the booster stand lopsided. By some miracle, the booster made it all the way back home, despite some really, really close calls. But back to the lunar lander. Its legs could absorb a large amount of impact velocity, and due to their crush core absorbers, they did not rebound like a traditional hydraulic absorber. They just compressed and then they stayed in that position. They were designed to handle up to three meters per second of vertical velocity with zero horizontal velocity or up to 2.1 meters per second with 1.2 meters per second of horizontal velocity which they could handle very reliably. Now, since NASA didn't know how much the shock absorbers would stroke or compress, and they were unsure of how deep into the lunar surface the LEM might sink, they didn't want the ladder attached to the movable part of the strut and potentially hinder any movement. As a matter of fact, NASA assumed the struts would travel a lot more than they did. Come to find out, two factors prevented them from actually traveling that much. The pilot's skills, and the surface of the moon's ability to absorb energy. That's right, the pilots were in a sense maybe too gentle with the LEM, and they all landed so stinking softly, there was hardly any perceivable travel on the legs. But then again, there were so many unknown variables, NASA was playing this whole thing extremely safe. The astronauts were instructed to cut the engine when one of three 1.5 meter long lunar surface sensing probes made contact with the surface. You've probably heard them make that contact call out. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a deep end. Boat control, both auto, deep end engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. This was intended to not only help prevent the engine from kicking up too much debris and dust for visibility and hull puncture concerns, but it's also because the engine had engine thrust decay. This is where even after successful shutdown of the engine, there's still some residual pressure that can last anywhere from half a second to a few seconds. All rocket engines have this. Fun side note, this little bit of extra thrust decay went unnoticed on the test stand when SpaceX upgraded their Merlin engine between flights two and three of their Falcon 1 rocket. After stage separation, additional thrust decay led to a collision of the first and second stage, causing a loss of the vehicle. The Apollo commanders were intended to cut the engine at 1.5 meters in altitude, which would have been the right height to touch down at a safe velocity and compress the legs enough based on what NASA thought would be an adequate amount. But despite all this, 
All six landings had very different actual impact velocities. Neil Armstrong gave Apollo 11 the softest touchdown with a vertical velocity of 0.54 meters per second. Apollo 17 was the next softest at 0.91 meters per second. Apollo 14 was next at 0.94 meters per second. Then Apollo 12 at one meter per second. Apollo 16 at 1.7 meters per second. And lastly, Apollo 15's commander David Scott finally gave her the beans at 2.07 meters per second. But that's still well within the operational range of the legs. And now a big concern was having the descent engine coming in contact with the lunar surface. And despite Apollo 15 carrying the additional mass of the lunar rover vehicle, having a 25 centimeter nozzle extension on the descent engine, landing on the steepest lunar slope of 11 degrees, and despite the nozzle actually buckling, the nozzle still didn't actually come in contact with the surface at all. The buckling of the nozzle was due to a buildup of pressure from firing the nozzle so close to the surface, and not from coming in contact with the surface itself. But another factor that was later accounted for on why the struts didn't compress that much was the fact that due to the moon's somewhat powdery surface, the surface itself would actually absorb around 80% of the impact velocity. And this is perhaps why the landing legs compressed so much less than they had planned, leaving the final rung higher than nominal. Okay, so basically the moral of the story is landing on the moon was a big fat question mark with the Apollo program. NASA took the most conservative approach to as many things as possible, including fail-proof shock absorbers, additional thermal protection on the landing legs, big fat landing pads, and contact probes to name a few. Suffice to say, they didn't want to make the ladder any longer than necessary and potentially hinder movement of the landing gear. So assuming things went as planned and the shock absorbers went deep enough, the ladder would have been a nice and easy step. But all this said, the final step still worried some astronauts. The commanders were actually trained to immediately attempt to jump back up to the bottom rung after initial descent down the ladder. This way, the pilot who is still inside the LEM could assist if there is any struggle to make that large gap. Neil actually commented on this before he stepped off the lander's pad. Okay, I just checked uh, getting back up to that first step. Uh, it's uh, that isn't collapsed too far, but uh, it's adequate to get back up. Roger, we copy. Pretty good little jump. Different astronauts had different experiences with the ladder, such as Jim Irwin saying the ladder was a real struggle, and 170 centimeter tall Pete Conrad saying, Man, that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. So to summarize, the final rung height was a topic for much debate, but with all the unknown variables, a bounty out there for every single kilogram to be shaved from the vehicle, and figuring jumping up and down in 1-6 gravity would make ascent and descent much easier, they also didn't know how much the lunar surface would absorb energy, so NASA left the bottom rung at its final gap of 76 centimeters from the bottom of the ladder to the top of the landing pad. Or maybe NASA could have just done what the Soviet Union planned to do with their LK lunar lander and just used a hinged ladder. So what do you think? Did I help answer all your questions about why the lunar lander's ladder was the height that it was? Let me know if you have any other questions about this topic or about the Apollo program or just rocket science in general. And stay tuned because I have a lot of really awesome videos coming up. I owe a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping make content like this possible. So if you want to help maybe add your voice to these scripts or help catch errors before these videos come out, or even just talk with other space fans, consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut where you'll gain exclusive access to our Reddit, our Discord channel, and and some exclusive live streams as well. Thank you. And while you're online, be sure and check out my web store where you can find things like this shirt, which by the way is almost sold out. And that's because we do runs of shirts now, so the quality is a lot higher. There's also like custom tags and custom packaging, but there's also tons of things in the store that are kind of constantly, we're trying to keep up with all these things like grid fin nauta coasters and mugs and hats and lots of other fun stuff. So be sure and check that out. And while you're on there, click on the music tab where you can listen to my music on Spotify and on iTunes and also a playlist right here on YouTube as well. Add it to a playlist this summer and let me know what you think. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.